Hi there, I'm Logan Medish, and this is High Caliber History. Today, I want to talk to you about the scary fact that NRA's Executive Vice President Wayne LaPierre now has unilateral control over whether or not to sell any or all of the collections in the NRA museums. Uh, both the one in Fairfax, Virginia, the one in Springfield, Missouri, and of course everything that is in storage in the vault. Um, this is something that just became public uh, knowledge to me last night um, because the NRA had their most recent board meetings uh, just a week or two ago um, and there were some resolutions made by the board of directors that changed how things operate with the museum and the collection. And this is all very personal to me uh, because I spent almost five years working at the NRA museums as their firearms specialist. In fact, I started working there nine years ago uh, today, the day of this filming. So um, there's, there's some insights that I have um, and some information and some opinions that uh, you may not think of otherwise. So uh, I, I have a copy here of what was in the bylaws and what is now in the bylaws. Uh, in 1989, the board determined, quote, moved that all firearms received through bequests, donations, and other means be reviewed by the NRA Gun Collectors Committee to determine items suitable for museum accession or deaccession. Furthermore, that after such review, all firearms deemed in excess or suitable for deaccession may be sold or disposed of after consultation with the Finance Committee in a manner best serving the interests of the National Rifle Association with such funds received from the disposition to be earmarked for museum purposes. Now, that in itself sounds fine, right? Um, people donate things to the museums all the time. Um, they're looking for the tax write-off, nothing wrong with that, but sometimes the museums have excess uh, of the items and, uh, or sometimes they end up getting another donation uh, in the future of a piece that maybe is in better condition uh, and museums have the ability to deaccession and sell pieces. Um, that's something that's laid out very clearly in a deed of gift. Um, and it's like that through museums all throughout the world. Um, it was like that when I worked for the National Park Service, it was like that when I worked for the Smithsonian, and it was also like that when I worked for the NRA museums. So the way they had things set up in 1989, perfectly normal. Um, although I will say that things didn't exactly run that way even when I worked there under that 1989 resolution. It said that everything that was coming in to be donated was supposed to have gone through the gun collectors committee and then determined uh, what was going to be done with it. Um, and I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that no donation of firearms that came into the museum in the almost five years that I was working there saw any kind of oversight from the gun collectors committee. Um, that they had nothing to do with that. It was solely in the hands of the staff at the National Firearms Museum, which, now, don't get me wrong, I worked with some great people there, uh, but the vast majority of the people working in the museum there are not museum people. Um, the now retired senior curator, he was a museum guy. Uh, before he spent more than 30 years at the museum, he worked for the National Park Service and the Smithsonian, just like I did. Um, we had a registrar there who, uh, and, and that senior curator had a degree in museums as well. Uh, we had a registrar while I was working there who had also worked for the Smithsonian um, and had, degree, uh, had a degree in museums. Um, but one of the biggest shortcomings for that entire museum is that it is not currently and has never been run by. A museum professional. There have been museum professionals working there, but ultimately uh, those of us who had the museum background were not the ones making the final decision. And so things got jockeyed around um, and stuff was done that was not up to museum standards, was not up to snuff, and quite possibly, uh, in my opinion, in some ways was probably illegal. Um, but I won't get into that. What I will get into is 
that small bit of gun collector committee oversight of the collections and how to dispose of things with it has now been completely undone at the latest uh, board meeting. So I'll read to you what is now part of the bylaws. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the May 1989 resolution is hereby rescinded and be it further resolved that the executive vice president, which is Wayne LaPierre, is hereby directed to continue or establish such procedures governing the gift of firearms as may best protect the assets of the National Rifle Association, not the NRA museums, and maximizes the value of firearms donations to the National Rifle Association and its affiliates, taking into account both the value of such gifts to NRA museums and the value to the National Rifle Association and its affiliates of the disposition of any of such firearms. So you see there, that took away the last small bit of outside oversight in control of the museum, um, and it is now entirely in the hands of NRA's Executive Vice President, Wayne LaPierre. So that means that even though the Gun Collector Committee played a very small role uh, in things um, while I was working there and, and at times under the May 89 resolution, which is what was in place when I was there. Um, so it was a small role, but it was a role nonetheless. There was something there. You know, you know, there was a little bit of oversight between that committee and the Finance Committee. But that's gone now. Uh, there is no committee oversight. It now lays solely in the hands of Wayne LaPierre. And that's scary because we know that Wayne LaPierre doesn't necessarily have the museum or even the NRA uh, best interests at heart. He's kind of got his own best interests at heart. Um, and it's scary because the NRA, as many of you know, is facing tremendous legal uh, fees and issues. Uh, I mean, they've been spending tens of millions of dollars and they are hemorrhaging money uh, on legal fees. I think I saw that uh, the most recent figures was that somewhere around a third of all the money that comes in from membership renewals goes right back out the door into legal fees. Um, which is absolutely crazy. And so I want to give you these numbers here that I, that I have as to what could be done uh, with the museum collection if parts of it, or God forbid, even all of it, finds itself uh, being uh, sent across the auction block. Uh, according to the 2019 IRS Form 990 for the NRA Foundation, which the museum falls under, the museum is noted uh, under the asset column with a value of $31.7 million. So it's not a small collection. That is uh, by no means chump change. Um, there are some amazing world-class pieces in that collection. Uh, but taking into consideration that in the most recent 2022 budget, the legal department alone had a budget of $31 million. They had a budget of the exact same amount as what the museum collection is worth. But through November of 2022, so 11 months out of the year with still one month to go, they had spent $48.4 million on legal fees. So they blew through the budget by almost $17 million on top of their $31 million legal budget. So what does that mean? That means that they could liquidate the entire museum collection and not even manage to pay for the legal fees that they are incurring for one year. That's terrifying um, because th to me, that means it's not off the table, right? Um, donations in terms of just flat out donations are down year over year. Membership renewals are down year over year. Um, it, they are in a tough spot, plain and simple. And a lot of it, if not all of it, uh, lays at the feet of Wayne LaPierre. And now we find ourselves in a situation where there is no oversight from the board of directors, which therefore means there's no oversight uh, from museum staff. Not that there's much museum staff left. When I was there, we had a total of eight full-time employees. Now there's just two. Um, but there's really no one standing guard uh, watching over that collection and safeguarding it 
um, to, to make good on the promises that were made to people who donated the firearms, um, understanding that you know only under the direst of circumstances that would their stuff be disposed of. You know, people give their things to a museum because they expect them to be well cared for, not that they expect there to be the possibility that their stuff could be sold off to pay for legal battles or cruises or new suits or cars or whatever. Um, but that's the sad state that we're in right now. Um, you know, uh, when I left in 2018 to go full time with high caliber history, I knew things were in trouble then for the NRA. And it's been really sad watching uh, as things have come out in the legal world. And I read things and I go, yep, I saw that coming. Yep, I saw that coming. Yep, I suspected that, you know, and, and on down the line. And so um, I am grateful for the time that I spent as the firearms specialist at the NRA Museums. I had the opportunity to work with some great people. I worked with the Gun Collectors Committee. I worked with all of the Gun Collector Club affiliates nationwide. Um, got to see and do and experience some amazing things there. Um, but I absolutely made the right decision to leave in 2018 because holy cow, here we are in 2023 and things have only gotten insurmountably worse. Um, and so that's where we're at. The board of directors has taken away the last guarding section uh, of, of anything that could protect the museum collections. And it is now 100% up to the whims of Wayne LaPierre as to whether or not they should liquidate some or even all of the museum collection. Scary times um, and very disheartening to me as a museum professional. So I'm very curious to know what you think about this whole, uh, this whole possibility in this situation. Let me know down in the comments. Um, if you have museum friends or NRA member friends, or if you've visited the museum, please share this video with them. Uh, let them know what is going on and what may be happening in the future. So thanks for tuning in to this episode of High Caliber History. Again, I'm Logan Medish, and I'll see you on the next episode.